Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trust Me, the Future of Digital in Higher Education, a dive into some of the challenges that marketing and digital professionals will be facing in higher ed over the next couple of years. I'm Kyle Campbell, I'm the founder of Education Marketer, and I'm today's guest host on behalf of the company that has made this webinar possible, Squiz. Squiz is a digital experience platform company currently working with around 540 plus customers in higher ed, the government and the private sectors. And if you're looking to make a bit of sense on your chaotic user journeys, or just simply looking to reuse your content more effectively across your website, it might be worth giving them a call. They even design solutions to fit your existing higher ed tax sack. And that is no mean feat. We know they are quite uh, legacy orientated and there's always little strange gremlins kind of poking around under the hood. But these people can help you put a bit of order on top of that chaos. And no doubt our panel today will have uh, many experiences and stories they'll probably share on that very topic. So let me introduce the other two uh, great people speaking here with me today. First from UCL, we have Samantha Fannin. Samantha is the Head of Digital Experience at UCL, and she's recently off the back of a pretty good keynote speech at Content Ed, where she was dealing with that very topic of uh, applying a bit more order to chaotic systems and processes and user experience design. Samantha, that's some very dangerous work in the kind of work that we do. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. And uh, the more you say those kinds of things, the more I think to myself, I really am a really, really lazy person. Like just that whole concept of bringing order to get, it's because I just don't like working on things that I don't have to work on. No, fair play. I mean, if the <laughs> can do a lot of the lifting for us, then yes. you kind of yeah. give your brain kind of exposure to that chaos every day, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And also joining us today from Squiz, the director at Squiz is Will Noble. Will's um, a bit of a guru when it comes to personalization. I attended one of his workshops recently and he really helped me think differently about how different generations respond to personalization and how comfortable they are with uh, companies and organizations using their data. And no doubt we'll get into some of the kind of details behind that later. But firstly, Will, thank you for that perspective. And it's uh, really good to have you here today. Oh, thanks, Carl. Nice to nice to see you too. And uh, Samantha, great to see you as well. Cool, amazing. Uh, before we dive into our sort of top challenges and, and pillars that we'll be going through, um, just a quick note to say that the chat is wide open. If you've got any questions, hopes, dreams, desires, just chuck them in the chat. Um, we'll deal with them as we're going along. I'll try and answer questions in context and put it to the panel. If I don't get around to it at the time, there's a Q&A section at the end and we'll dive into those in a bit more detail. So our first pillar that we're tackling today, I don't think it's any major surprise to people, but it's about generative AI, shock horror. It's about the birthday of uh, ChatGPT as well. This thing has been in the market now for just over a year. And there's all kinds of stuff flying around in different technologies and like uh, innovations happen off the back of this thing. Um, and it's sometimes really hard to position ourselves on a single um, position or stat in which we can build a, a narrative around. But this one for me is pretty strong um, and it seems to have a bit of enduring quality because it talks more about user behavior rather than a, a brand new shiny tool. Now, it's no surprise that Generation Z are kind of big users of this tech, and that stat has done its uh, fair amount of rounds. But if we look at the second part of this, this quote, this is the thing that really interests me, and I think it's a good jumping off point for our panel. Over half of our audience, that younger youth audience, now trust these tools, uh, the output from these Generative AI tools, to help them make informed decisions. Now, when I saw that, I was just really shocked. Because as a digital professional, you're kind of aware that some of the outputs from things like ChatGPT, Google Bard, they're not always as transparent as they initially seem. The information presented does sound plausible, but actually it's full of hallucinations, misrepresentations, and it's a little bit dangerous. But ultimately, it doesn't look like our audience really care that much. They're willing to trust these, trust these technologies and their outputs. And if you think about how something like that applies to um, generative AI when it's embedded in something like Google Search, this is Google Bard, um, just a quick demonstration of it. 
Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see how we can create very compelling sounding content based on quite complex queries. So just for an example, I've chucked in a pa paragraph of text talking about my degree requirements, the grades I've got, where I live, and all this information that a student would need to consider when making a study choice. And in fair play to this AI, it does a fantastic job of pulling together a 100% piece of personalized content in the window where I am. I don't need to go anywhere. Everything's just right in front of me. That's remarkable. We haven't had a technology that genuinely answers a question almost in, in real time before. We've had to pull together information in the kind of old fashioned ways of using web pages, right? I know it sounds like, it doesn't sound that like old fashioned, but this is how uh, things are moving now. Um, so let's ground this a little bit and why this might be a big innovation. It might be something we need to consider, but I'd like to put a little bit of more thinking behind it. So Samantha, my first question goes to you. In, 2004, and this is what I'm thinking back to now, um, there was no shortage of so consultants out there saying that social media was this next big thing. And in a lot of ways, it has become that. But a lot of the advice was, you won't need to worry about your website in 10 years' time. You know, Facebook's just going to replace that. That's where all the interactions are going to going to happen. And I can't help but think this is, might be the same conversation that's happening around AI, but you've worked in the space for a decent amount of time and you've seen these changes come and go. What's your take? Do you think um, AI will augment current services or do you think it is a profound enough shift that it will have to fundamentally alter the way that we, we deal with digital? Um, I, th I mean, I think, I think fundamentally it, it will have to. However... I would say this thing that we call websites. So like kind of, we've got a very fixed idea in our head about the thing that we call um, uh, websites, but you, you said it exactly there, it, it will augment it. We still need information somewhere. At some point, a person needs to transact or make a decision or do a thing with the piece of information that they're maybe searching for, or they're being entertained by, or they're trying to get under the, um, the hood of, particularly in relation to higher, uh, higher education, the, the course I want to study, the university I want to go to. I have to arrive at information somewhere. And, and so this, this place where that information lives, I think will still exist. But as content people, we have to get significantly better about how we present that um that for me is kind of the 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 best impact that that gen ai will will have social started to move the dial a little bit that you had to you had to offer what users wanted on websites you have to present the information in the way that they want to consume it we haven't moved the dial enough and i'm kind of hoping that gen ai is is the next big leap that we 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 take in terms of content design Okay, so you mentioned that we need to think differently about the kind of content we, we present. What are some of the kind of top things that universities should be considering in that regard? What's the, the sort of go-to actions that need to be taken in the, in the face of this technology? Um, look, at, look at how people are consuming the information, look at where they're consuming it and the kind of content that, so it, it's, it's short and snappy, it's visual. We've been saying for a very long time and, and social media teams within um, uh, universities have been saying for a very long time, we need to have students out there creating the content for us. We need to have, we need to be putting the tools in people's hands to be able to create this really great content. But you still look at their corporate websites and they're not really walking, walking the walk. You know, mm. they're, they, they're, they're arming up their, I think if you look at most universities and you look at the social media teams specifically, there are always tiny, under-resourced teams that are desperately trying to do things in really, really interesting ways, but just can't fight the, the tidal wave of corporate policy focused information. Um, listen to your social media teams. They're normally closer in age to the to the target audience that you have as well. Listen to your social media team, words to live by, right? Yes. Um, you're, yeah. you're so right. The <laughs> The size of a social team has pretty much stayed, I say, <clears throat> static since these teams were brought into into existence. And um, a lot of universities still have one person, and they typically have those. Oh, I think some ridiculous, like seven plus channels to communicate with students on. And you know, you look at your own night like, content team; it, it's just not possible to handle that many channels with with just one person especially when you're trying to focus and be great in that in those channels i mean how what's the size of your your general content team i imagine it's a lot bigger than just like a handful of people isn't it and that's just a website yeah so at, at ucl we're very we're very lucky um 
I mean, we have we have a lot of content creators. We have a lot of people who have content added on to their their day job. I would say there's probably there's over a thousand people trained across the university to manage content in some way, shape, or form. However, that's not the uh, the core of their their daily job. And um, what I'd like to see is content taken a lot more seriously. Um, our social media team, which sits alongside the, the web team, um, are relying a lot more on uh, student journalists, student uh, content creators, and trying mm. to kind of uh, pull a lot of expertise from, from there. Uh, but the big shift that we're making is uh, content design. So bringing in more content designers who can actually work with the subject matter experts. And if we could grow one number of uh, skills across the university, I think it would be content design. Yeah, it's an absolute under underrated profession, isn't it? It's a really deep and skilled profession. There's a lot more that goes into it than just publishing content on the web and repurposing it. It's, there's that integrity of information and we will be um, touching on that a little bit later. So. Will, um, I just want to bring you in here because you do a lot of traveling around the UK, you meet with a lot of different universities and, and providers. Um, Samford mentions that th this new generative technology, so AI technology, is like a, an augmentation, it changes the way things are done slightly. Um, is that your experience on the ground? Is that what you're hearing from other universities? And similarly, in specific reference to information architecture, um, in the past with content design, we've built a series of flows. So we look at top tasks and how users cascade mm. a series of actions to a conclusion. Do you think that sort of way that we approach these sort of things are going to change over the next few years? Now we've got this additional layer of generative AI on top or do you think it's probably time to really almost harken down into these ways of working, actually make our information more structured than ever to inform these models? What's what's your take on that? I think it's the latter. Um, and uh, thank you, Carl, for starting with the big meaty pro topics uh, with AI <laughs> straight in the morning. It gets easier um, after this, right? <laughs> um, but to answer directly to your question, as Sam mentioned it earlier, um, you know, where where are these models? What is the source of truth for these models and where they're getting them from? Um, mm -hmm. I suppose before we go into that, though, it wouldn't be worth saying the big, you know, Christmas special Hollyoaks drama that's happened over the weekend with OpenAI and, um, yeah. and the ousting of their CEO, which definitely calls into question where this, this, this goes ahead from now, right? So I think what you've rightly articulated, Carl, is that the launch of this product a year ago was probably as big as Google just coming in, right? And through mm -hmm. word of mouth, it's just exploded and people have started to use it and it's got a direct application to it. Um, but it's very much a product. And if all of the engineers from OpenAI go into Microsoft, then you can wager that it's going to turn something more into a platform, which may have more applications and other, that may change the way that universities have to respond and and build their information architecture and build sites in the future. But going back to that um, training data, I was listening to, I was with a Red Brick University um, not that long ago, where the academics were went to the communications team and saying, well, we should, we should stop open AI from indexing our content. That's our intellectual property. We shouldn't allow them to have access to. And the comms team rightly understood, well, that basically pulls us completely out of the game, right? We then have no stake, we have no impetus into representing our institution in these channels that we know 50% of audiences that were surveyed have tried out and used it. Um, and so if you are going to be that source of truth, there's even more impetus to make sure that we do publish in your own domains does have that way is well architected and, uh, and is clear and concise so that things like BARD and, uh, and other large language models can, can leverage it. Um, we've had other institutions come to us saying, hey, we want to put chat GTPT into our site search can you do that for us um and we can go yes but then we can have no determinism about what those results would be so mm. you're having to to run the risk of like say hallucinations and if your whole business is being this being this source of truth um and you have built an entire brand around it you can quickly erode that if you were to start leveraging these um uh, these tools right now that's not to say that in the future uh, that you can't. Um, 
I think where it can be quite useful, and there was a, I forget the name, but a developer at St. Andrews University, um, he did a post on LinkedIn, we'll try and find it after this, but he used open uh, chat GPT to build information architecture for his university website and saying, how far could I go to basically get myself out of a job? Um, and it did a really good, like it did a really, uh, it did really well at putting together a coherent structure for, uh, for good content and what should go in each of these sections. And that kind of thing, okay, it's still a useful aid for uh, academic staff or uh, site builders like ourselves to build some kind of consistency to make the web a cleaner place to, to visit. Um, but then one final point on your, um, your query you put in there, Carl, that's quite a lot of cognitive load that you're asking for an individual to, to come up with. And our experience finds that prospective students and people using the web, they they like to click around. They don't necessarily don't want to sit there and try and think about how they can put together a coherent question. And uh, talking from personal experience, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 16, <laughs> um, let alone give some direction to uh, to a bot to, to help me out. Yeah, no, you make a good point. I mean, a lot of the choices that young people make is mainly on what their, their passion is, their interest is, what, what inspires them, the much more... Mm motive elements i mean guess i'm guilty of just trying to break something i enjoy doing these things and pushing these <laughs> you, know, they can match. Um, you made a really interesting point there about uh trust we, we consistently see in there's lots of research published around this that university websites are highly regarded .ic.uk these high value um trust areas on on the web and by implementing ai tools on your site you are right you're almost eroding that that trust because you can't um, get behind those results with complete authority i know there's some work happening in open at the moment about making the responses that it creates more repeatable so being a little bit chaotic in its response and that came out of its dev day but you're right to mention leadership changes and how these sway the direction of the product didn't it start out as a charity or something like that it really doesn't behave like one <laughs> Um, so there's lots of different sways in these uh, these platforms. And yeah, the CEO moving to Microsoft might just change the direction of that company mm. uh, entirely. Um, I want to ground this a little bit in this, this idea of trust. And I'm really glad you did a nice um, segue into that. And I was doing a bit of research recently into what um, the the power of a website is and what the value of, of web is. And Samantha, you alluded to also to the power of transactions. Someone has to go somewhere eventually to do something. And it turns out that websites are still these really big powerhouses for doing things like this. So in this is a recent report from GWI. Um, it's a global survey, hundreds of thousands of respondents. And this particular part of the survey looks at where people uh, go to get things done or interact with brands. So those more meaningful connections of conversations website just completely dominates and in fact um people are twice as likely to do these sorts of interactions on a, on a web-based property uh, than they would in uh, social media so for instance um, half as likely to follow a brand on social media and half as likely to visit a brand's social uh, media network page and this doesn't just apply to audiences generally a lot of pushback i normally get on this is that oh that doesn't apply to the youth audience they're doing everything in social and they are doing a lot in social media uh, in terms of discovery but when it comes to actual interaction with with properties with websites um the the web is this real sort of dominant force and you can see here 1624 yeah website at the top and actually across all generations so much research out there that highlights the different media habits and consumption habits and online habits of people based on age but we've got a lot more in common uh, than differences sometimes and you can see here the hierarchy in these lists they don't really change that much until you kind of get around to the middle so a lot more similarities uh, between people and then we tend to give ourselves credit for so Samantha, I want to go to you for, for this. You know, we've just learned that websites, if you look at it through certain lenses, they can generate as much conversational traffic and engagement as something like a social media platform like, like TikTok, for instance. So firstly, as a web professional, how does that make you feel? Um, and secondly, what do you think powers this sense of trust that websites have this enduring sense of trust that websites have and how do you think digital leaders should be going about harnessing some of that trust um lots lots of parts to that um 
I mentioned uh, I mentioned at the the top of a uh, transactional. I think social our social presence doesn't actually give people much of an opportunity to complete their transaction or or do the thing that they want to that we want them to do. We still tend to bring them to our website to complete things. I mean, maybe you know if 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 you cast. Uh, creates a, an amazing TikTok version of of how to a- apply to your chosen university. We might see that kind of shift a little bit for for that demographic. But I think the way organisations approach their online presence drives a little bit of of this. We we want to show you a pretty picture. We want to tell you an interesting thing. But ultimately, we want to get the view on our website. Mm. Um, maybe if we start to get people to think a little bit differently about those key metrics, then again, that might help uh, shift that you treat it like a, a, a channel that you have control over. On the trust piece, I think a lot of it, um, I think a lot of it's been built over time. Like if you think back to the uh, the mad old days of uh, Web two, so that was the like, that was the the big thing. We, we're now putting tools in people's hands to be able to create their own online presence and suddenly anyone could could publish to the web and I remember um I remember doing presentations 20 years ago trying to uh, convince uh, the powers that be that they needed to invest in content professionals because for every and the numbers are just hilarious when you think about it uh, time-wise for every I think it was five million pages that went on the web for free a hundred thousand were 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 published by content professionals. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that, those kind of those kind of numbers are happening, you know, every every nanosecond now. Yeah. But um, the the point being that if anyone can publish out on the web, then how do you know what you're looking at is uh, genuine and moves around uh, uh, domain uh, domain name validity and and understanding uh, uh, what that kite mark actually means can start to shift but we're looking at a generation that does actually look at multiple different sources and doesn't take that first source as the one and will jump around as much as they they need to to ensure that they're getting uh the 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 truest version of what they need there is no single source of truth anymore thankfully they're going to lots of different uh lots of different places will we see that shift i'm not entirely Sure, I think that what you need to do is protect your online presence reputation, uh, throw a, a ring of steel around that and and don't get it wrong and 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 don't screw it up because if you if you waste that reputation currency, it it takes a lot to get that back. So you mentioned there about um, changing the metrics that you use to look at the performance of oh. well, social media channels. Um, traditionally those metrics have been set by the social media companies i mean there was no such things alike until facebook invented it so likes impressions shares do you think there's probably a better way to be to be looking at this because in, in my understanding they're more like analytics like things you check to see if there's sentiment they're not really metrics to evaluate overall performance how would you think differently about that and what do you think people should be looking at instead if they if they should be um Gosh, I wish I, I I do wish I had the 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 secret sauce answer to to that because I think you know uh, Black Mirror has been sending up the concept of a like having any meaning for for years and years now, but how else how else do we do any kind of return on investment? You know, we started off the call by complaining that there aren't enough people in the social media teams, but you know how are you how are you actually measuring uh, success to say that it it's worth? Some of it has to be about just trusting. Um, it's a bigger piece. And I, I'm going to come back to content design again, because the, the the thing that creates the step change for me is if you're very user focused, if you're asking what users want, if you're asking users how they want to be interacted with, that then gives you something that you can um, uh, you can target. And so a like... Um, let me take this back. Let me take this back. Um, our social channels at UCL show that we have uh, a, a beautifully warm, supportive, engaged student body. Ultimately, what does that do? 
And I, I, I'd love to be surrounded by, um, uh, actually, you've probably got social people on this call. If, if I could throw it open to, to the people on the call to kind of uh, come in with questions about how they tackle that one, um, because I don't know what the secret sauce of that is. Yeah, it's it's a very hard thing to get your get your head around. I mean, what I've heard a few different approaches. So one is looking at general lift. So you want a campaign over X amount of time, and then you look at impact on those more strategic metrics and applications and all those sort of things, enrollments. Um, the the other way to look at it is potentially, and this is picking up on your your kind of content design approach um, is looking at audience behavioral change. So as a result of having a better understanding of what an audience wants, are they more likely to do X, Y, Z action as a result? Not just using metrics or license shares as something to fulfill a measurement or a metric in itself. It kind of measures, it, it's like a big circle. It doesn't actually measure the audience change. So yeah, there's no sacred source um, at all. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. And ultimately, a lot of the stuff that happens in these these channels is um, very difficult to measure because it's in private spaces. You know, the content could be shared in like WhatsApp groups or whatever. There's no way to apply metrics over the top, despite what these uh, companies um, might be might be telling us otherwise. Um, Will, I want to talk to you here and and, and bring you in because um, when we're considering younger audiences, um, you've done a bit of work on how um, personalization. And the way we approach personalization in those spaces uh, might be different depending on different generations. And, you know, it's quite easy to assume that in some of those private channels where young people spend a lot more time in places like Discord, et cetera, that they have a high regard for, for privacy and they're quite very strict on how their personal information is used to, to target them and offer them more personalized content experiences. Um, but you shared a piece of research recently that, highlighted that that isn't necessarily the thinking there's some different numbers behind this would you mind sharing that and what your insight is and how perhaps we need to think about these audiences in a in a slightly alternative way sure <clears throat> well it kind of ties into um samantha's point that it's found that there is a sense of an elevated sense of digital literacy around the people that we're trying to university are trying to serve but also this level amount of digital skepticism so not just taking exactly what they've uh, what they've read as um, as gospel as uh, you know when people first got Facebook and were just anything they read on that feed was um, was tantamount to a government um, memo um, but perhaps it's because the so the study that you were that you were citing was looking at um, individuals trustworthiness of brands of, of using their data for good instead of nefarious means such as reselling it and not actually uh, uh, providing any value and the generations uh, before Generation Z, if you want to call them that, were a lot more skeptical that businesses were going to use their data um, for things that weren't going to be beneficial to, for them. Um, but when they surveyed the, uh, the most recent generation, they were thinking about 17 points more trusting that, do you know what, I'm sure this brand hasn't has only going to do good things with my data and not do anything. Um, anything bad with it and I suppose we come back to trust and the inherent brand building the university's had over the over the last 50 plus years that it's going to be even higher for for institutions um, and perhaps that's because if you've grown up using social media channels like TikTok and you inherently know that your browsing preferences are going to provide you a more valuable experience later on so um, maybe there's a just perceived this is the value exchange and so I'm willing to give up my personal data if I get something in uh, return, which is a more pleasurable experience and more dopamine that, uh, that goes into, uh, into me. And that feels like a, uh, a step change if you're sort of worried about privacy for universities. Like, okay, if we know that to be the case, there's a mandate for it. And there's lots of other studies from um, the global analysts that show that if you provide a more relevant experience to individuals, um, they're more likely to return and they're more right to make that job to be done, do that call to action, be it an application or, or, or visit a welcome pack. But perhaps the word personalization can be a bit scary um, because everyone's talked about it for the last 10 years, but very few have um, have achieved much of it in the university sector. But perhaps it can be a way of just reframing the thinking. So we're all familiar with you know, first and third party data sources. Um, there is such thing as zero party data sources where you're asking the individual to provide 
to give up a bit of information about them. So say I'm interested in postgraduate courses. Um, once that individual has provided that information, then make sure any other future interaction with your institution keeps that in mind and pre-filters content so they only see stuff that's relevant for them. Um, and that's where we see the most impact for just making small interaction changes that are more helpful for the individual, such as if they've applied for an open day, you've got their name and email address and you can follow that person as they interact through your site, pre-populate forms if they ever fill out anything else in the future. Um, and that's where we've seen some, um, some nice success. You think a lot of institutions maybe bite off more than they can chew with personalizations. Is that um, you know, Samantha, you're not in there. I'll bring you in here. It's clear you've got some personal experience. So do you, do you feel that we try and almost handle the world before we've even got the basics in place? What's the reality look like? Yeah, I think that I um I think uh, we'll just describe that perfectly. It's those tiny, it's those tiny little changes. So we talk about um uh, central to everything that I do around digital experience is trying to reduce cognitive load. Um and uh, you make everything as 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 seamless and slick an experience as it can possibly be. And I think it's those tiny little um those tiny little things like you know um seeming seeming like the, the site that you're interacting with or the organization that you've requested information from seems to know you without feeling like actually they've turned on the ring cameras in your house and <laughs> are observing everything that's going on. It's those tiny little things. Um, and as institutions, we tend to try and do things with kind of massive programs and massive plans and actually just just bite off the, uh, just grab the low hanging um, fruit, I think a lot of the time the back of that comment you made there about ring cameras lighting houses my house is like alexis and a stupid number of rooms i've got a ring camera on the door like yeah i can basically see inside my home no doubt yeah. will you've mentioned um about this younger generation's openness to having their data used by for corporations is that simply because they are just surrounded by this stuff every day and they've just become accustomed accustomed to it is, is that the change that we're seeing here um, I think certainly there's that and that they've seen value from providing it. I think at the beginning of the web two, Samantha mentioned a lot of time we would give up our information without realizing it. Um, and go and browsers and Facebook pixels would track us across the web and we'd get all of these ads that we didn't really want. Um, whereas if you've grown up and received a more insightful experience, then, um, uh, that's, I think it's the paradigm shift. So you're more open to it in the future. Let's have a quick look at how some of that information can be used to create experiences. Um, another stat that really blew me away recently was we we kind of know as I assume we, we will know as digital professionals how valuable a good uh, digital experience can can be. But increasingly, I'm seeing the value of this being portrayed by students as well, not just as a nice to have, but as a key thing that they consider when looking at universities. And this one is just remarkable. The high proportion of students expect the quality of their digital services um, on campus to be the same quality and the same importance as their face-to-face -face learning and their general life on campus, right? So that is a, a huge differentiator when making a, a study decision. And unfortunately, just across like our sector in general, we're just not quite there yet. So it really highlights that if you're investing in these programs and you want to invest and, and do more, that you do have the backing of the audience to do it as well. It's not just something we need to keep pushing through. Um, similarly, I saw another report that bounced off this and it was more on the digital content side of things. And it looked at the reasons that prospective students change their minds about a degree. So they might choose business and decide, that's not for me, I'm going to go and do marketing instead. Top reasons for that are naturally things like career choices, entry requirements, the big ticket items. But coming on the bottom of this study, and this study was by um, Net Natives, I believe, um, marketing, communications, digital content, not just as a persuasive mechanism, but the actual reason that someone looked at a course and thought, ah, oh, it's not for me. Poor, poor quality content being a driver. So 
these things really um, matter. And we're starting to see it come together in uh, a number of different areas as well. So now we have about fifty percent of students saying that the quality of their university's digital experience was that key factor in their um, university selection. You just don't normally see this sort of stuff and those hierarchy of reasons that someone will choose a course and an institution. And as time progresses and technology exponentially just moves even quicker. It's going to be become harder for us to keep pace with those student demands and expectations. So, Samantha, universities aren't short of great ideas for digital experiences. There's, there's tons flying around. But one of the key elements that I think is often missing a lot from these proposals, and maybe after they, they are even implemented, is this idea of governance and holding things together. Um, you have said that you're not a fan of digital anarchy, your, your content ed talk made that quite clear. So as this pace of technology almost gets away from us, do you think the process of governance and digital design systems needs to uh, evolve with that? And, and if so, what what does it look like? Does it need to be quite different to how we've done it in the past? Um, is it different? Um, I don't know if there's necessarily different. I think that maybe the um, the ambition, the scale of the ambition, the way we approach it has probably always been there, but the the tools to enable us to to do that. So if I think about um, in our specific scenario, um, when I talked about digital anarchy, um, we have a, a real we have a real problem with consistency. Well, I think most institutions will have a, a problem with consistency and creating um, a, a connected student experience and um, and I don't mean, you know, uh, uh, in terms of consistency that, you know, the, the logo is always on the right or whatever. Um, what students always tell us in survey after survey after survey is, do you know what? I don't really mind if you're going to WhatsApp us and email us and text us and stick a, a, a notice outside the, the lecture room. They don't mind that all of those things being in place as long as we're consistent in how we approach them. So if I'm going to ignore my email, I know that I can ignore my email because my email is just where you tell me about offers in the in the restaurant. Um, it's not a case that actually one of the, the fundamental deadlines I need to hit is going to come in by, by email, maybe once in my three years at, mm. at, at UCL, et cetera. So what we try and do with the design system is and we're only kind of on we're we're just coming out of um uh version um not point one of it but we want to give people all of the tools that they need to at least start thinking about things from the user perspective so how will i fill out a, a form what, you know will you use name will you use forename will you clearly we're not going to use christian name um it, that it's the same thing again and again and again so that there's a sense of familiarity and that i'm not having to stop and think every time i use a digital touch point and i think it's really important um the the previous slide said about um they want their digital experience to be as good as face to face and and campus if you think back to how we all felt uh, during the pandemic and you can almost split us by by our age range about how excited we were about the idea that oh we can all work from home now and we can use teams versus mm -hmm. people who just took it for granted that you yeah. would be able to connect digitally with your with your colleagues you didn't have to go into into a building and there's an expectation that if I want to be on campus or I want to be remote I will have the same learning opportunity you're not going to diminish my learning opportunity and there's not going to be a piece of information or an experience that's closed to me because I'm either in the building or I'm um, at the other end of a, a laptop. I love your point there with your design systems how you're essentially removing choice sounds really bad but essentially that's what you're helping people to do like so when they're yeah. faced with creating a web page yeah. and they have an objective you have a series of pathways for your uh, your users, your creators to to follow, right? And you've given the form as mm -hmm. an example. Um, you're on one point. What was the issue number? One point oh, one point something. You're quite early early days, <laughs> right? Yeah. I imagine you've had some decent feedback from that. What's the sort of sentiment with your your users? I know it's not always like straight down the line, but have you had general positive feedback from those, that support? 
Yeah. Um. So it, so far, it's been very it's been very positive. I know I know there's going to be um there's there's going to be less positive the the more it's used and the more it gets out there, yeah. um because it's not going to be perfect for everyone. But certainly for this first iteration, it's been incredibly positive because. Um, nothing existed existed before. So whether you're some, so we we work in we we follow scaled agile. So what that means is that we we all work in lots of different product teams, and whether you're engaging with um, a supplier or a third party to maybe build a new online shop for UCL, or you are putting in a new uh, campus experience where you're reporting broken toilets and broken lights you can go to the design system and see how to do it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to think about how you talk about things. You don't have to think about um, uh, our our design principles and, and go back and have a workshop on creating design principles. It's all there for you to point somebody at. So, so far, feedback's been very positive, but that won't be the case, I know in six months time or a year's time when we have everybody <laughs> using it that's uh very optimistic <laughs> yeah <laughs> is the, um, we is... want that right we you know we want that we we, we needed we needed to be useful um yeah we needed to be useful do you have um forums and other ways that people meet to discuss more chunkier projects so we've spoken about the general day-to-day -day stuff there and it's good that you've got technology in place to um, at least automate some of that I imagine when you still get big requests come through, there's a there's a process dealing you know, with those. Do you have like a regular web meeting or how do you make sure the stakeholders' voices are heard for those more complex queries? Uh, um lots of different lots of different ways. So on the big technology pieces, um it it filters through like those product teams. So the product owners are representative of the businesses. So they need to be connected with end users and their stakeholders. In in terms of say the the digital estate itself, we have um our model, our, our content management um, framework has uh, uh, site owners and content managers who meet very regu regularly. And then we have our community of practice. So everything surfaces through uh, that way. So we treat our digital estate as a, as a standalone product. And then we treat our publishing platform, Drupal, as a, a standalone product as well. And so everything surfaces that way. Um, yeah no it's um it, it's good because i guess then you don't have those kind of chaotic requests just constantly come into individuals and they deal with them and then those bigger projects fall off the radar so yeah good to hear yeah well um i want to uh, talk about governance a little, a little bit here and the best way to uh, get it get it surfaced at a strategic level um governance doesn't tend to be discussed typically um in a, in a university environment unless something goes hideously wrong um so in, in your experience of working in universities, what's the best way to almost get governance on the table when the sun is shining um, and as a, as a process that we need to be consciously aware of in front of senior leaders before it absolutely has to be dealt with? What experience have you got from working on that sort of stuff? <clears throat> um, good question. So um, the, the clue of the answer is in the question in the sense that start early. Um, you know, put together that advisory committee before the project has started, and um, and uh, uh, and then what we what we found is when you can put an organisation is about to embark on a digital transformation initiative or change a key component about how they interact with their visitors um, through digital channels is introduce them to others that have done it before. They can understand the pitfalls, and so we would. Um, mirror up to organizations so they can share learnings and higher education as a sector does really generally does really well with this um, about sharing ideas and sharing what works and, and what doesn't work um, but going back to your earlier comment about the 50 percent or is it 91 percent of students it, believe that their online experience is going to be as good as it the physical one i think it's okay to my, call out that like creating digital products and servicing them over a long period of time to a big audience is challenging and universities don't have the headcount or maybe the expertise at or the the knowledge at the executive level to get the budgets that they need to be able to execute on those expectations and then students will, and there's all loads of writing online on they go on the, 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 the hybrid campus right where students are experienced expecting to be able to you know watch a live lecture while cycling into the 
campus on their phone literally walk directly in and it's there's just been no disruption of service and that's the kind of learning experience that they're thinking of when they're coming to universities and the reality is very different but how does an institution even design for that and samantha mentioned about like creating a design system is a fantastic first step right you can bring um uh, design principles that bring consistency so people know how to navigate different products across campus and you can run it decentralized but when you're talking about that hybrid campus, then you're thinking about how can we make consistent user journeys and make those principles coherent, um, which is something that um, is definitely food for thought. But um, going back back to the governance issue, so you know, um, we run scenarios at the beginning of a project to say, okay, how is this going to plan out? Who's going to make a, the authority to, to sign this off? Who are you bringing on the journey with you rather than going and creating something you know, in closed doors and then rolling out to the world which invariably results in lots of grumblings from academics and other parts of the business um there's a great piece by eric greenberg who's a digital leader at um, wharton university talking about um digital products are like uh, against three p's right it's people process platform and if you see them as a venn diagram of concentric circles and oftentimes technology is seen i oh, will buy this tool and it's going to save save the world and we're going to be able to deliver on everything that we said we would but then they don't hire any more people to manage it or to create it and it has to go on top of your existing workload um, and you don't change any of the the process around it and ultimately those projects fail and squiz has been that shiny product when people have procured us and then uh you know downsize the number of people who work in digital for that organization um and ultimately, that doesn't that doesn't lead to the best outcome. No, I'm I'm still very much stuck on the idea of designing a lecture to be consumed on a bike ride. Um, I think that's <laughs> I think that's insane. Um, but I love those reports because they drop fairly consistently, and they are always produced by Deloitte or McKinsey, and they mm. present this very rosy view of what a sector should should be. And they do have the data to back it up. These are fantastic organisations, but it feels very divorced from what is possible, except for a small handful of, of universities. So you're absolutely right to call it out. And sometimes it is about just looking at those those first steps. Do you have um, a, a way to have a little bit more personalization yet? If not, then you probably shouldn't be designing a lecture to be consumed in all these different ways. And I can see the press and PR stories now that a student crashed into a wall where I can see them. <laughs> Probably shouldn't even bother in the first place. Um, I'm going to bring us home here of our last um, pillar. Uh, this chance has been doing the rounds probably for uh, the last month or so now, um, but there's an extra layer of detail underneath it that I think is quite interesting. If you have missed it, this is highlighting how social media is essentially becoming media. Um, so the idea of engagement and conversation isn't so much at the front lines of these companies now. It's more about attention and keeping people on platform as long as possible. When I first saw this chart, I thought it was over a period of 10 years. But actually, it's only a period of three years uh, from 2020 to 2023. And it shows the reduction in referral traffic um, from social media to top news sites. So these are things like The Guardian, uh, Wall Street Journal, all these sort of publications. See a massive drop off here from 120 uh, million referrals in 2020 down to just bottom of the barrel, scraping the bottom here with just like 20 million in 2023. Now, you might be thinking, I'm a university, I'm not a publisher, it doesn't really apply to me. But underneath this, there's other research that's gone on by Semrush and Kepios has highlighted this is now a issue for regular websites as well. Um, Semrush did a piece of analysis with some top consumer brands, and it turns out that they've experienced significant drops in social media referral traffic uh, within the last year. And Kepios has also done a similar piece of research, and 62% of brands have been affected. So I think the days of getting like free social media traffic to, uh, to our sites is, is coming sorely to an, an end. Um, I want to question a little bit about this now. So, Will, you've played a you know a pivotal role over the last ten years in helping managers almost like shape their their digital experiences for students. Um, we know that social media is a big deal, but do you think the end of referral traffic, or at least a significant decline of referral traffic to websites, is a um, a, a major issue? Um, does it mean we need to change how we do things? Are things already being changed? What's your what's your thought on this? How should we approach this as um, marketing and digital professionals? Um, 
well, that last sentence is um, very poignant, right? If, if it's happening to everyone else, if it's happening to you, it's happening to everyone else. And um, at the end of the day, what you can only take ownership of what you can control. Um, the, the issue is that there's a decay of these two-sided market platforms, right? And there's a um, the sci-fi writer and technologist, Corey Doctorow, calls it the enshittification of these platforms, right? They game it all oh. for gathering revenue um and it's not really that and we're all having to play to their own game and follow minute changes to algorithms there was a comment we talked about the we don't have enough headcount in social social teams you know even corporate organizations with 10 15 plus social media um executives are still trying to play catch up to them um so where can we go from here i mean well let's just focus on where can we provide good content design make sure our information architecture is easy to use, provide that distinctive voice, make sure that we build products that take sustainable development practices into account. Um, Cause then we can, those are the things we can master off, right? And then um, try and leverage other ways that we can uh, get our, our message out there and take that ownership of brand. Cause ultimately we don't have as a sector the ability to make influence over these big conglomerates. And uh, I don't think they really care uh, at the end of the day either i don't think anyone can that's it <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the yeah. you know if, if government can't do it then um the higher education sector probably isn't it. <laughs> how many times has rishi tried to invite um <laughs> the um, leader of facebook over for a inquisition <laughs> yeah. for him just to go you know get out of that's all right I've, I've got other people to be speaking to yeah. um samantha is this generally your experience as well are you are you concerned are you changing how you do things or are you just kind of leaning into those trusted uh, user journeys yeah no i think um exactly to to will's point about um you use information like this to help you win those arguments about the the structure and the sustainability of your digital estate because this is the same arguments we had all those years ago about um google's your home page do you remember when you know like uh, thankfully it's only the odd time you have to have those ridiculous arguments about something going front and center on your home page like that that argument's kind of been one that your home page isn't your home page anymore and this is the same kind of idea that your digital estate should be the cleanest most usable um easily navigable um, uh, part of information that it needs to be with discovery at the, the, the top of the agenda. So tell me a little bit about um, discovery and how that might be evolving then, because when we hear the word discovery, it, it's quite often that we in, immediately, well, our minds go to like social media networks to be discovered in feeds, and that might be part of the, the way we go forward. But do you think equally looking at web experiences there's probably more scope now to build out digital tools that are customer facing mm -hmm. helping audiences um, build a picture of the kind of degree that they're, they're going to study like yep. do you think there needs to be potentially more um, dev focused work in parallel with content professionals to build out that discovery element of the web absolutely and it's to what will said about you know um and he'll have an experience of people who've who've purchased the platform and then not had the people to to actually make it do the brilliant things that it can it can do we don't invest enough in in search and we don't think about it and think and this brings us right back to the the top of the call about um gen ai so we have a, a generation of people who ask more nuanced questions of a search engine they don't just tap in english into into a search um uh, and and so if if we're structuring our content in the right way, and if we're using, if we're implementing the right tools, then somebody can arrive at our um, at our prospectus and can have almost a, a, a real time conversation with an automated career counselor who can lead them to the the ideal set of things for them to to study either for their future career, for their own personal interests. All of that can be taken into account. Yeah, definitely that um, desire to build that that layer. I've seen a few companies playing with that. The ambassador platform has a, I believe it's like a digital student assistant, like a digital ambassador who's an, an AI essentially. And um, they, they're always awake. They're, they're always answering questions and they are essentially trained on websites content and then you can have a conversation with them. So 
those those tools are in their in their infancy, but you can easily see the utility of them maybe a, a little bit further down the line. Before we go to um, Q and A, and yeah, please feel free to pop your questions in if you if you have any. I, I just want to go back to our, our panel just one more time, just to say out of all those pillars and those challenges that we've we've discussed, um, uh, Will, I'll go go to you. So, what, what do you think is the most prevalent, most pressing, or maybe even the one that people want to deal with first before all others? What's what's the kind of pressing issue, most important one that people should get their head around? <clears throat> oh, can Samantha answer that before I do? <laughs> I, was really <laughs> happily, I was really hoping you did that. But I, I, yeah, I, I just want to go back. I want to go back to what we said about uh, about um, discoverability. I think that's the most. That's the most. If I could just get people to think from the perspective of the user and not treat, not parcel up their content based on marketing friendly content student education friendly content staff policy content it's all just content and we're all users and we all want to find it in and consume mm -hmm. it in the easiest possible way so yeah get some professionals <laughs> to, to to manage it for you they actually packaged it up um, <clears throat> One of our earlier sessions, I had a conversation, I can't remember which which college it was from Squiz, but we were talking about how different people understand content in different ways. So if you're producing a piece of written content, is it worth producing some audio or a video to go with that? How can you, you know, des design content so it actually meets not just in terms of top tasks, but actually meets in terms of how people consume, how people learn and, and things like that. It's also like another layer that you put over the the, the general content design approaches. Will, what was your, your take? Um, I th yeah, I think what Samantha said is, is very salient. Like, inf what does the, why does the internet exist? Really, it's for information retrieval, right? And uh, universities have been at the spearhead of this since the very beginning. Right? The whole point that the internet existed really is for organizations to share in um share know-how uh, amongst each other um and audiences um patience for for finding that information is dwindling right our attention span is uh, is falling off a cliff us as digital professionals have to be group proactive to that and try and make sure that information is you know is readily accessible um but also realize that you can't or you can't go all the ocean you can't go and take a corpus of universities like ucl will have hundreds of thousands of pieces of content online um that it's going to be very hard to go retroactively at the moment and tag all of that up that's going to be really useful for for uh, for for visitors um do i see that changing in the future with the emergent technology probably um but in the meantime, you need to leverage the tools you do have to make sure that you can in, uh, search, for, find content that's structured or unstructured and that perhaps isn't perfectly well, uh, well suited. Um, and that definitely comes back to um, looking at the way that you're doing your basics, you know, and, uh, and taking what um, Jerry McGovern has uh, has recommended that you cited um and doing that way because that really is the um that's that's the area of control that you do have i like your point about attention span i've i keep changing my opinion on this uh and i think i'm coming around to your way of thinking so it, it, initially my gut reaction was always like but young people watch netflix for hours they have infinite attention spans it's different content right you know at team choosing your degree and choosing your path for a website to get something done it's a little bit different to kind of settling in and, and watching netflix for a period of time so yeah but designing these things are, are really important because you almost need to keep aware that if someone someone needs to keep engaged in the process that you're taking them through otherwise you'll you'll lose them it's a uh, almost like we're in like one big piece of competition for attention right it's you know it's just content like you said samantha um so we need to approach each piece in almost like a similar way but yeah it's not just a simple case of saying well they watch netflix that's what means they're gonna stay attention <laughs> get connected to what we create for the whole duration 
Um, we are kind of close to time here and I don't see any questions that have um, come in. So um, I just want to thank our panel. Uh, it's been uh, really great speaking to you today. You've opened uh, my eyes to a few different ways of thinking about these things and uh, I enjoy the, the back and forth. Um, so I guess, Samantha, where's the best place that people can get in, in touch with you if they want to follow up on any of the, um, the, the points that you've shared today? Uh, uh, my, I didn't put, did we put my work email address on this? Um, uh, my, publicly. yeah, <laughs> um, and I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn, um, where I don't really post very much. I'm on Twitter where I mostly post about cocktails and cats. Um, but we are, we are, <laughs> yeah. um, we are planning to do, um, some week notes around the design system, um, from before before the start of the new year, um, a lot more working out loud, and we're making our resources publicly available via that. So our design system is at design hyphen system at ucl.ac.uk. Uh, please give us feedback. There is contact details on there, and I'm really happy to answer any questions, comments, queries, general wonderments. That's amazing you made it public. Fair play to you. Yeah. Some nice thinking there. That's not um, very common. So, yeah, that's really, really great. Um, Will, what about yourself? LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Always LinkedIn. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you very much, both. Good speaking to you today. Um, a recording this webinar will be uh, available over the next couple of days. And if you want to reach out to any of us, it seems like LinkedIn is a good shout. And do visit UCL's uh, very public design system. It certainly will be after Thank this call. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks.